You hear a lot of people talk about habitats and the importance of maintaining habitats. Well, habitats are pretty large structures and they are made up of lots and lots of different components. For instance, in the forest behind me, we have the canopy, we have the understory, we have the forbs and brushes, the shrubs on the ground. We have the leaf litter as a layer. These are all, this habitat, this forest habitat is divided into layers. Those layers themselves, like the ground litter, for instance, contains other areas that are even smaller habitats. And these are things that we call micro habitats. A lot of people don't understand the really um, cool necessity of these micro habitats. There's a lot of animals that do not leave their little micro habitat. Even though they've got a huge habitat in which they can range around and, and explore and get food and everything else, they don't go anywhere. They stay within their little micro habitat. So what exactly is a micro habitat? Come on, I'll show you. So here's what I'm looking for. Dead logs. This is an example of a micro habitat. And hopefully, this is a hardwood log. Hopefully, I will find somewhere in this. Ah, <laughs> yes, right here. Hello. Hello, baby. Right there. That's what I'm looking for. This is a best beetle. And the best beetles are pretty amazing. These guys live in these rotten logs. In the springtime, the male and female best beetle will, will mate up, they'll pair up, and they will find themselves a log, like this one. They prefer the hardwood logs, the uh, maple, the hickory, and, uh, and specifically a log that's been on the ground for a couple of years. They like their wood seasoned. They're very picky. They're very picky log eaters, if you know what I mean. So they're gonna get in, and they are going to uh, start to move in and tunnel into those logs. As they're tunneling into those logs, they begin to uh, eat the cambium layer. That's the layer in between. What are you going? Come, come here, come here, come here. There you go. That's the layer. The cambium layer is the layer in between the bark and the hardwood. And that's what they're going to be using for food. Now, as they're in there and they're eating this, they, uh, at springtime, uh, they do what animals do in the springtime. And the female ends up laying anywhere between 30 to 70 eggs inside of that log. And the, both the parents actually begin to care for those young, for those larvae. The larvae of beetles are called grubs, and they begin to care for them. And uh, these grubs, as they grow, will molt their skin periodically. They go through what's called an instar. That's what we call it with insects. It's an instar. And that instar is basically a generation of larva. Well, they're going to go through three of these instars until finally they begin to, to begin to pupate. When a larva begins the transformation into an adult, that's called pupation. Uh, just like a caterpillar will form a chrysalis to form a butterfly. It pupates inside the chrysalis. Well, these guys, the larvae, when they form that third instar, the parents then cover those larvae with wood pulp and frass. Frass is nerd for insect poo. And they cover them with that, and that's kind of their little cocoon. In the springtime, when those beetles, have, or when those uh, larvae have now pupated into adult beetles, they then hatch out of that, leave the log, and go find a mate and a log of their own to begin to raise their own kids. And you can see there's a beautiful little best beetle right there. Absolutely amazing little animals. Insects that actually care for their little babies. Who'd have thunk it? That's good stuff. All right, I'm going to put you back. Very important, by the way, when you're putting, when you've rolled a log and you found something, it's very important when you put it back to carefully put it back and then, then return the animal. And that way the animal has a chance to get under. There we go. They can find their own way under at that point. If you just flip it over on top of the animal, the animal might get squished. So flip the log back then put the animal next to it and let them find their way underneath the log. Very important. It's not just down trees, but it's standing dead trees. These become home 
for not ground dwelling insects, but other kinds of insects that will move into this tree. And as they move in, that provides literally a buffet for woodpeckers and nut hatches. If there's enough food, those animals can drill into it, maybe build a home or do something along those lines. That home then becomes a place for flying squirrels or other animals that will move in after those other birds and things have moved out. So this whole standing dead tree is an amazing microhabitat. So what other places can be a microhabitat? Let's explore. The root system of trees that have been blown down. Big piles of spongy moss. Even the muck around a lake is an amazing microhabitat. Any of these small subsections of any habitat can be a microhabitat. So I want to challenge you get out there, explore around, see what microhabitats maybe you can discover, investigate the animals or the tracks or the things that you find there, and see if you've discovered an animal whose entire world is no bigger than a hollow log.